All right, well, good afternoon, everybody, or evening as the case may be. And thank you all for coming to this session, Understanding Customer Patterns and Instrumenting Your App for Telemetry and Analytics. I know that the, the evening party and Xbox on the big movie screens and stuff is coming up right after this, so I appreciate you coming here this last session of the day and hope you enjoy the evening as well. My name is Craig Brockschmidt. I'm a senior program manager in the Windows ecosystem and framework team. I've been working with the developer community and a lot of doing a lot of developer content for the last couple of years. In fact, um, I'm the author of this book here. I hold it up on my tablet because it's a free ebook from Microsoft Press, Programming Windows Store Apps with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, second edition of which will be out probably Monday or Tuesday. So the current edition, Programming Windows 8 apps, is the Windows 8 version. This will be the Windows 8.1 version. And I have to admit that it was a little late in the game that they announced that uh, you could write JavaScript apps on the phone, so I just kind of slipped a little bit of that in there where I could. But most of it's very applicable to the phone as well. And because it's a free ebook, if, even if you're not working in JavaScript, there's a ton on there about WinRT itself and about the Windows Store and just about writing apps in general. So you can't lose, it's free, go out and get it uh, and enjoy. Now before we go any further, I have a favor to ask you. If you can, if you have a Windows uh, machine here, I don't have this on Windows Phone yet, but if you have a Windows uh, capable machine, Windows 8.1, go out and get this app right now and play with it a little bit uh, because you'll help be helping my demo a little bit later in the session. I have instrumented this particular app to gather various telemetry data that I am interested in that we'll be talking about. And if you're using the app a little bit as we're um, uh, talking today, then you'll help generate some of that data for me when we get to the demos. And I do have, if you managed to solve the puzzle, I have a few prizes up here for the people to get the best times or the best number of moves. So if you happen to solve the puzzle by the time, you're, uh, by the time this talk is done, please come up and I'm, I'd be happy to give you what I have up here. Now let me tell you a little bit about why this session is interesting to me and why I think it's interesting to you. For me, having explored the whole extent of the Windows platform, really from end to end, everything that we have in the, in the platform with the Windows Runtime and Windows uh, WinJS and so forth, it's been very clear to me that, that that part about using the platform features to build your app is really only one portion of the whole app experience. I like to say that when you publish an app to the Windows Store or the Windows Phone Store, you're going into business, whether you realize it or not. You, you have become a business person. You're running a business now, and that means you have customers. Now, if your business happens to be that I'm in business to have nobody find my app and, and nobody use it, well, you know, that's one thing. But if you're in the business of solving customer problems, if you're in the business of serving those customers and doing something useful to you, then what you really want to be understanding is what those customers happen to be doing uh, with that app. How is, how is that app serving them? Are the things that you're interested in, uh, in, in usage, are actually how people are using that app? And this is where the question about telemetry comes in. Telemetry and the analytics that go with that, and I'll, I'll talk just a little bit about the differences between the two, is to really, again, understand when your app has been released out there in the world, what are, what are people actually doing with it? How are customers using it? If you think about it a little bit, um, you know, I, 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 once when I was a kid and a teenager, I, had, I was trying to hang a picture on the wall in my room. And my dad built the house, so I don't know if he actually laid out the studs in the wall where they should be. I know when I've built sheds, I say, well, I can cheat a little bit and not actually put all the studs I'm supposed to. But I remember you know, trying to knock on the wall and figure out where that stud is, and I, I poked a hole, and well, that didn't work. So I, I, I kind of kept going to either side and either side, and eventually I had this two and a half foot segment on my wall with holes poked every half inch, and I still didn't find that silly stud. Now, you don't want to be doing this with your apps. Right? You don't want to just be guessing of what your customers are doing or where that sweet spot is in your user engagement plans or other things that you're trying to accomplish. You don't just want to be poking holes around and hoping for the best. You really want a way to know where, kind of where, you're, sorry, oops, I skipped ahead, where your, um, kind of where your gold mine is uh, within that whole thing. 
So you always have, no matter what business model you're trying to implement, and we'll talk about this just a little bit, you always have certain goals in mind, whether it be monetization or just building user base and so forth. So you need to know if your app is really serving those goals and if the investments that you're making in that app are serving those goals. And this kind of data then get, helps you understand where to make future investments in either that same app in updates or in uh, additional apps that you may be creating. And in fact, uh, getting telemetry from one app is a fabulous way to really understand how to design additional apps, especially if they have similar characteristics or, or maybe not. There's a lot of different things you can learn from that. So let me make it clear what we mean by telemetry, what we mean by analytics. Telemetry in the word itself means telemetering or metering at a distance, measuring something at a distance. I have probably, as many of you do, I have a power meter on the wall of my house that PG&E here in California, I live up in Nevada City, California, which is three hours up Interstate 80 from here. Um, I have this power meter on my house and it is basically getting readings and through either Wi-Fi or, or something or through the power lines itself, it is sending that data back to PG&E. And I can go within a day of um, whatever day I'm interested in and go to PG&E's website and actually see my usage by the hour which is really helpful if I'm trying to uh, conserve energy or, or see how, what's the effect of my air conditioning in the summer. Now, I wish that my water meter had that. I have a water meter that's just under a cover outside my house, and I have to go out there and check it manually. Um, and, and because we're having a, a pretty serious drought here in California, I'd really love to be tracking my water usage day to day, but I can't do that. I have to go out and look at it manually. Now, there are, of course, many situations uh, where telemetry is gathered in, in many different areas uh, of, of human experience. Like I say here, you know, we track spacecraft, we track wildlife, we track all kinds of stuff with telemetry data. But there are many times where you simply cannot go to the site where the meter is, so you have to have telemetry instrumented in that device somehow or another to collect it and send it back to you. You wouldn't at all imagine launching a spacecraft, sending something out to Mars or sending Voyager out there to the, 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 the hinterland of the solar system without having some kind of data feed coming back to tell you what the health is, what's going on with that particular thing. Similarly, if you were to invest, think about it this way with the stock market. If you were to invest in a stock, what would you think about investing if you said, well, I'm gonna put $5,000 into this stock, but I don't get to know anything that's happening with it for the next three years. I can't check it. I can't check the price or the performance. Would you invest in that? Probably not. But you think about your apps, you're investing a lot of time and energy in your apps. You're, you're, you're doing a lot of work in there. And so if, if you don't have telemetry in there to know what your customers are actually doing and how it's performing for real out in the wild, then you are, as I say on the slide, really flying blind. It is just an essential app feature in my mind. And I, I'd like to, if there's anything else I leave you with today, it's the idea that telemetry that you instrument in an app is just as important of a feature as anything you're gonna to show to your end users because it really gives you the value and reports on the value of what you've done elsewhere in the app. Okay. Now analytics on the other side is what kind of comes out the other end of this. So telemetry data is gathered on a per user basis at each location where your app happens to be installed. Your app is gathering this stuff and then it's sending it into some kind of a, lo a server on the web somewhere. You gotta have internet capability uh, in your apps to do telemetry pretty much. Um, so that's collected on a server. So that's just a whole bunch of data. Guys that like big data like telemetry. They like playing with all this stuff. But really what you're interested in as an app designer, as a business person, as an app developer, is what comes out of the other end of that, which is where we talk about analytics, where all this telemetry data that's been gathered is aggregated together, analysis is performed on it so that it can be then reported as some kind of actionable insight, a chart, a graph, grids of different values and so forth that you can then evaluate and see are the things I hoped this app was accomplishing out in the wild actually happening? Is my app performing as I think it should? Are, what actions can I take with this data? Because you can get a lot of telemetry data, but if it's not really aggregated together, you're gonna to spend a lot of time analyzing it, and you don't wanna do that. So the analytics side of this equation, which there are a number of providers that are in the business of providing analytics that we'll talk about, um, are the really important part of this. 
Now, there, there are three kinds of analytics, and I want to touch on uh, the first two briefly, and then we'll talk about the third one a little more deeply. The first one is market-wide analytics, where you get to know what's happening with the Windows Store as a whole, with the Windows Phone Store as a whole, with the app ecosystem across all platforms as a whole. That's one great piece of data. Another piece of analytics you get comes from a store itself, such as the Windows Store. You can go to their portal, as we'll see in a moment, and see what that app is doing from the store's point of view. And then the third piece is then what you personally, in your app, collect from the users, uh, which is very specific to the behaviors that you're trying to track, because the, the market-wide stuff really can't track that uh, for you. You have to instrument your app in certain ways. So let me switch over to my demo machine here. If I can log in and just show you a few of those uh, questions. So let me go first to the Windows Store dashboard. This is where I have this 15 plus puzzle app uploaded. And if I scroll down here, you'll see here's my app in the store. It'll, and it'll give you some basic information like how many downloads I have to date, my ratings and re, uh, so forth. If I click on reports, then I start seeing some of the analytics that the store itself can collect. Now, someone asked the question yesterday in one of the store sessions, like, why is this data always like three, four days old? How come I don't get things a little more up to date? And they said, well, it's because of the way our backends are structured and the data from the store doesn't get to this server or that server. And they're working on that. Uh, but generally speaking, you know, this, this data is just a little bit old. It's uh, as of uh, April 1st. And I can see the effect on here of my downloads when I you know, did certain blog posts or sent emails out within Microsoft to say, hey, help my demo out. Can you download this app? And, and people did that. Um, so you get some summaries here. This is what the store provides. It gives you some information about exceptions and crashes that have been reported through Windows own telemetry. And I'm very proud to see that I have zero crashes in this app. Um, I did actually, the first time I released it, I had a bug in my telemetry layer itself that was causing a crash. <laughs> uh, I was like, ooh, I got to go fix that. I was actually, one of the things I was interested in knowing is whether or not somebody had connectivity when they completed a game. And the check I was making for that, I, I was getting the uh, internet connection profile, which was coming back null, oops, and then checking one of its properties and crash. <laughs> and it only happened when I was walking away from my house while playing the game uh, and went out of Wi-Fi range. But anyway, um, so you can see you get, you get downloads information. You can um, you know, check by country. You can check by age and do d different demographics and so forth. Uh, downloads by market, where it's coming from. I got some interesting users around the world. Uh, downloads by age group, so a lot of different uh, information that the store will provide you about your app. Now, for market-wide analytics, there's a couple of um, providers that are really into doing this. So companies like Distimo, App Annie, uh, or this one, App Feds, they are really harvesting and mining the data that's out there for the different app stores to help you understand trends in the stores as a whole. Uh, to help you compare your app to other apps in your same category. There's a lot of different information that they can harvest through the public information that the stores surface to then give you um, insights into the, the market as a whole. So if you go into something like AppFeds, you'll see that they're surfacing very interesting charts like this whole thing of how many apps are in the Windows Store by, uh, by date and by category, which you can you know, filter and uh, take off some of these uh, different categories and, and change the graph. So you can see that we got uh, some growth going. Looks like we just broke through 100,000 total apps uh, here in March. So that's pretty cool. And you'll get some other information they can aggregate, such as uh, numbers of app published by uh, developers and category popularity, number of apps per categories and games category. So you can see here I'm in a puzzle game, so I have the most competition of any category in the entire store. And then interesting things like this. I found this graph uh, quite insightful. The, the middle one there saying that you're basically very evenly split between x86, x64, and ARM platforms. So when you make a decision about, well, do I upload a package for each of the architectures? I think the answer is clearly yes. Now, if I saw in here that ARM was this very tiny sliver and I was trying to create and invest in, say, a Windows runtime component or a library that had a binary dependency on a specific compilation architecture, then I could say, well, if it's going to cost me more to go to an ARM platform, maybe I can exclude that until I make some profits from my app uh, you know, on other platforms. But the case of the matter is, is that we get pretty even distribution there, so it's a wise idea to be able to target all of those um, at the same time. But anyway, that's 
And just a quick example of the market analytics as well as the store uh, analytics that we get. But now let's talk about uh, going back to PowerPoint. Let's talk about your specific telemetry, the stuff that you put into your app directly. What you do with your app telemetry wise depends a great deal on your business goals. So we're gonna be tracing the idea that you have an app, you're in business with the app, you're going to have goals for your business, and somehow that has to translate through to the kind of telemetry that you're collecting and the kind of analytics you get out the back end. So it all starts with the questions that you're trying to answer to drive your business goals. Now I like to say there's four primary business models for apps in the store. I call them the four Fs, uh, even though one of them spelled PH, but in English that's a, an F sound. Fame, fortune, fun, and philanthropy. Now clearly if you're in uh, a different, one of these different business models, you are going to have different business goals. If you're in the market for fame, you want to acquire users, plain and simple. So your questions that you, you lead into your telemetry have a lot to do with customer acquisition and how successful are your strategies there. Now if you're trying to monetize, you're trying to earn fortune, then you have monetization strategies. You have um, questions about discoverability of in-app purchases and so forth. These are all things that you're very interested in. And I especially want to point out the, the, the lower question there in that uh, row of are there customer patterns that can be monetized, going back to the title of this talk. Now to give an example with my little puzzle game, um, when I play it, because I've figured out the, the, the way to solve the puzzles and I can kind of rip through them really quickly now, um, is that I will play a game and finish it and then I will start another game and play that and finish it and I will go through a very fast cycle of completing games and going to the next one. Well, I'm really interested in knowing if other people follow that pattern, if they get into this quick turnaround from game to game. Because if they do, I can interrupt that flow with an interstitial ad just annoying enough that you'll want to pay me something to get rid of it. Okay, this, this is a very good strategy for monetization is, you know, break up that flow, make it just not so annoying that people hate you and they uninstall your app, but just annoying enough that people are willing to pay, you know, 99 cents or whatever it is uh, to make that happen. So, but there's a lot of different patterns that you can look at to see whether something like that is possible if there's a monetization strategy that would work for the pattern of your users. Do they flow through your app in a certain way? Do they hit certain pages? When is the ripest opportunity to present an in-app purchase? This is the kind of stuff that's answered through your telemetry. Now, just to finish off this chart, if you're in uh, business for fun, then you want to share your joy with others because you're having fun writing apps, and clearly you want to know if people are enjoying your apps, right? If, if you're in the business of sharing joy, well, how do you measure that joy? How do you measure whether people are excited about your app and engaged with it, maybe sharing it on social networks? And finally, if you're doing a, a philanthropic a philanthropic cause, if I can say that correctly. Um, you want to know about the message that you're delivering, whether people are willing to support that cause, either financially or through uh, other means and so forth. So in any case, one way or another, you have different goals for your business that you're trying to achieve, and you have certain questions that you're trying to answer according to those goals. So then what follows is your telemetry design, your questions that drive, you're, you're trying to, you're asking these questions and the answers of those then translate into user actions that you would like to drive. User actions that are going to be beneficial to achieving those particular goals. And if you start looking at those questions, like I say, are there user patterns that I can track for potential monetization? That leads me into the kind of data that I need to collect, when I need to collect it, what kinds of uh, different things I get uh, when I try to log all that stuff, that, that, that's the data that's going to answer those questions ultimately. So you, you're just mapping from your business goals to the questions to then the telemetry design that you're going to implement. Now I note down here at the bottom of the slide that this is very different from logging in, during development. Now we all do console logs or logging in some way or another that reports on the internal health of the app during development. What's the app doing uh, at different points in time so that we, when we look at performance graphs and we get those things, if we see a memory spike, we know what was going on because we've tagged those events in our logs. That doesn't answer the same questions as a user level telemetry design. 
because you may know that you're going in and out of these pages and allocating this and, and loading this bitmap, making this HTTP request and, and building all these structures in memory that you're logging during development. And that's great for performance analysis and great for memory analysis. But that's too much noise to know whether a user is actually engaged enough to share you on a social network. That kind of stuff doesn't answer. Plus, the logging that you do during development is generally stored locally on a system and you know, you know that logging can create huge files that you gotta clean out all the time. And that's not the stuff you're gonna be uploading to your, uh, your service provider. So these are really two different things, your customer telemetry, tracking telemetry, and your logging. So keep those uh, in mind as two separate things. Okay. So once you know what questions you're trying to answer and the kind of data you need to gather them, the way you express your design of telemetry is through what pretty much everybody calls events, like logging events, but these are specific kinds of user events that you're trying to track. Basically, if you think about the labels and the, um, the, the navigation points you're going to have when you do the analysis later, when you go to the analytics portal for whatever provider you're using, these are gonna be in the UI of the website. Uh, of the web portal. So you want them to be human readable, you want them to be meaningful to whoever is trying to consume the analytics later on. So you're not trying to log everything you possibly can, really the, it, it ends up being about 30 different actions or verbs uh, that, that most apps end up with. So you can, uh, you can, you can think about this a lot with, in terms of, um, you know, like, uh, you may want to know things like page entry and exit, which is typically what you do with dev logging, but you know, for my game, I want to know when did you complete a game? When did you restart a game? When did you switch grid sizes? When did you, um, you know, go into the, the best scores page and did you switch that view from moves to times? When did you go into my settings and change a color option, for example, or turn the sound off? These are user events that I want to know that have, again, nothing to do with dev logging. So, the, the other thing you want to think about with events is that they always have properties and attributes to be a little more specific about what's going on. So when, um, like if you're implementing something like an RSS reader or a news reader of some kind, you don't necessarily want to know that, you know, about mouse clicks or, or taps themselves. You want to know what content was actually tapped on and maybe where on the screen that content sat when it was tapped on. So you can generate some kind of a heat map of where the user is actually engaged with that content and maybe drive the size of those items or how they're laid out and so forth. Uh, so you want to know that this is what the properties and attributes then give you that specific information about where it is on the screen or what news article specifically was tapped. So you can, you can collect that separately from the event. So you're just looking at different levels of information, the, the gross granularity of events and then the finer granularity of properties and attributes. Now what's very important with um, any kind of numerical value, as I point out on the slide here, is that numerical values can have a really wide range of values. And all of this is usually going to end up in a chart. That at the end of the day, what you get through an analytics portal is a chart of some kind from all this information. So imagine you've created charts like this, right, in Excel where you, you do it and you just got like 60,000 different little slices in a pie chart. That's not very usable. It's not very actionable. You can't really derive insights from that. So the best practice that uh, is generally recommended is that you bucket these uh, numerical attributes into ranges that are meaningful for you. So when I track uh, how long it takes somebody to complete a game, then I want to know like a granularity of one second between zero and 10 seconds, but after that maybe I want to know 15 second intervals up to say two minutes, and then maybe 60 second intervals beyond that. So I can bucket my things in there, so when I get a chart, I get something that's meaningful to me. And this is why I say telemetry is really a feature for an app, because you need to debug it after a while. There's going to be errors that you find, or you're logging uh, information and you see not a number showing up in your graph, or something like that. You say, uh, you know, I did something silly. And I'll show you an example when, when we look at the actual telemetry from this game where I, I realized that I didn't bucket things in the way that was most actionable for me uh, with, the, with the time it takes between games, because if you finish a game and then suspend the app and it's sitting in the background, you come back a week later, it's gonna log, you know, God knows how many seconds. <laughs> and then I get this long tail of big numbers um, uh, on my chart, which isn't very useful. So I'd need to change my layer to, to, to do a, a maximum slice and just go from there. 
Uh, we'll see that, all that in just a moment. So just to go over a few typical events, I'm not going to read this slide, of course, um, but if you think about different kinds of apps, they're going to have different things that are interesting. Uh, let's just focus like on the commerce apps down at the bottom here because it's a commerce app is very unique in that you have things like shopping carts and you have items that are viewed and what items are viewed after an item. You know, if you look at a, a site like Amazon, these guys are instrumented like you wouldn't believe to figure out, you know, what are you looking at? What did you go buy? What did you buy at the same time? What other users that looked at this have looked at that? You know, all that information that you get about suggestions uh, for things, you know, is all coming from this kind of instrumentation on their website. Netflix does the same kind of thing to suggest movies for you. I was laughing the other day. Um, many of you probably know Charles Petzold, the author that goes way, way back. Yeah, Dave, you know him. <laughs> uh, he's one of my friends on Facebook because we, we, we've known each other for a long time. And, and he said, what does it mean when Amazon comes up and suggests my own book? <laughs> Because he said, here it is. I forget which book it was, but he, yeah, I, guess, I guess I like myself. <laughs> That's, I think the way he put it. But in any case, there are, you know, you'll see different events that are meaningful for your particular app design. Now let's talk about the process um, of going about doing this uh, before we go into the demo that I show with uh, my code. So you have two choices when it comes to actually doing the instrumentation. I call, there's one is the hard way, which is basically doing everything from scratch. You know, you can, you can create a logging service in your app. You can put stuff locally on the hard drive. You can create a back end where you collect all the stuff. You can then, you know, write a bunch of back end code to do analysis and, and spit it out on some portal. Now, fortunately, there's a lot of uh, providers that have already done this work for you. And so if you want the hard pain and wasting your time just creating a, uh, a, a telemetry service, go ahead. But I think it'll be a lot easier for you to use one of the providers that are out there. There's actually quite a bit of choice here. Um, if you go to, we have a, um, a services.windowsstore.com, there's a link at the end of this deck, um, has a lot of listings of third-party providers for a lot of different categories, like ads and monetization and um, payments, and also analytics is one of those. So there's a, a group of them, like Marked Up, Adobe Amateur, Localytics, which is the one I'm using that I'll, I'll show a little bit about, uh, Google Analytics, Parse, and then Microsoft's Application Insights, which is currently in beta, and there's been a few sessions here this, uh, this week about that, um, that all provide a lot of support across different languages and on Windows and Windows Phone equally. Um, and then there's a, a number of others, like Flurry, which is the number one um, analytics provider right now on the Windows Phone store. Um, they don't have full support across all the languages, and, and they're either Windows Store only or Windows Phone only, but you may find that uh, these work really well for you uh, in different ways. But just to say there's a lot of good choices out there, and they all pretty much do the same thing with logging events and giving you analytics on the back end. One caveat that I'll note is that there are some differences between how these are implemented. So Localytics, for example, for a JavaScript app, I get a JS file that I include, in my project, and that's just this like 23K file or, or smaller than that that I include. And so I can still do an any CPU target when I go to the store. I don't have to be specifically targeted to x86, x64 ARM, which I would have to do if there's a binary component like a Windows runtime component or a DLL. So just make sure that, you know, if you have a restriction there, check to make sure how that uh, provider is implemented and that if you're targeting Windows 8.1, not all of these guys have moved their stuff up to Windows 8.1 yet. So just, just a warning to double check that before you, you, you make a commitment to anyone. Now let's talk about what you do with one of these SDKs, what you do with one of these providers. It's a, a pretty simple process. You'll go to uh, their portal whatever it may be, like localytics.com, you'll create an account, and then you'll create keys for your app. And it basically says you're registering an app there, and then you say, give me a key for this. Now, you notice that I got uh, three arrows here next to the get the SDKs. So you gotta actually download some bits and put it in your project. Uh, they're labeled dev, beta, and uh, release or production. This is really, really important to do. When you're debugging your telemetry layer during development, you're gonna have a lot of bad data. A lot of bad data. <laughs> this is the purpose of debugging a telemetry layer, is creating bad data so you can make it into good data. 
Um, so you want to have a key just that you can fill with garbage, that all the back end is going to get polluted with all this stuff, but you can ignore it because it's your dev key. But you want to separate that from a beta key, which you're sending out to specific customers where you're testing features that you don't know whether you're going to release. And you want to have that data also then separate from the stuff you're actually, when you release the app for real and get your real customers out in the wild, their data is distinctly different from your beta information and from your dev data. So the typical practice is to create different keys for each of these so that the back end will log them separately. Uh, pretty simple to do, um, but a, a good thing to, an easy thing to miss that will cause you much grief. Because <laughs> then your, your dev is doing some test after you've released your app and all this bad data is showing up in your production key. You don't want that. Um, these keys are then used to initialize whatever SDK that you're using. And uh, once you do that, you're then logging events by making different calls. You, like uh, Localytics just has a, a localytics session dot uh, tag event, I think is their API name. You just throw out the name of the event and whatever properties you want, and it logs it in its back end. So constantly as you're using apps that are instrumented in this way, it's you know, periodically uploading interesting data to the back end associated with your key so that later on you can go to that portal and look at the provider's dashboard and look at the data that you're getting. So uh, that's just the basic uh, process with that. Now let me go into um, my particular app and try to describe what I've been doing and how I've been thinking about it. So now I'm not really in the apps business. I'm, I work for Microsoft and I'm not trying to make a bunch of money through apps, but when I work with community and I work with trying to understand your perspective on our platforms and your perspective or, or your reality in producing apps. I want to put my shelf in your shoes and say, okay, let's say I'm in the business of creating little tile sliding puzzles. This is some, I, I personally like them. I like playing with these. So let's say I want to go into business and try to create the best and breed of these things. And I want to see what opportunities are there, what my competition is, do all the market-wide an an analysis I can, find my opportunities and go after them. Uh, so in my business development, though, I'm thinking that, well, what I first want to do is grow a customer base. Uh, we've really seen that it's hard to monetize a small number of customers. You know, at, at best, you can usually expect to maybe be monetizing 5% of your customers if you're doing like a free app with in-app purchases. So you need a, to, to just get the numbers right, you need a lot of customers. So usually if you're first starting out, you want to acquire customers first. So I want to explore those strategies. And as I acquire more customers and understand how they're using this app and what patterns are there, then I can look at my monetization opportunities like I described before with you know, like how frequently they're playing uh, certain sizes of grids and, and repeating uh, the process of playing that. So that's one thing that I want to be answering. And the other thing I want to answer is just understanding where to put future investments. That I want to put my time developing the app into where the customers spend time. You know, why should I spend a lot of time if I have a statistics page where it just shows you all the aggregate data from your play. And if I find that one out of a thousand users ever goes there and the most time they spend on that page is about two minutes or two seconds, then I'm going, you know, I don't think I'm going to hire a designer to make it look prettier. It just isn't worth my investment to do that. But if I see a lot of people are going there, well, let's engage them a little further. Let's, let's see what we can do with that. Let's start then adding things like achievements and awards and other medals and things of that nature that would be um, more engaging for users on that page. That's the kind of question I want to answer. And if I'm in the business of creating um, more apps like this, more tile sliding games, and I say, well, this is not the only one that I might ever produce, and I may do things like um, picture sliders or different sizes of puzzles and so forth, then I want to get a lot of data that tells me about that kind of app in general that I can then apply to future designs. This is really a gold mine for you. If, if you're going to create a class of apps and you have the opportunity then to mine the data from one set of users and drive the investments uh, for a next set of users and really shortcut the process of design and development because you already know what's going to engage people. And that's super, super valuable. That's data that you can almost sell generically to other people, other developers, because they want to know what's engaging. If I was standing up here and saying, I can prove to you the top 10 monetization strategies, you'd be here saying, tell me about the top 10 monetization strategies that really work. 
because I know they work because I've been collecting the telemetry. I'll go talk to, go to Bernardo Zamora's session on that. He's, uh, I think he may have already done it or he's doing it in parallel here. But you know, he has, he's one of the top Windows Phone developers. He works in our developer marketing group. He's still a top phone developer and he has a lot of good information about that uh, that he likes to share. So now let me go into um, uh, my app here. And you see my stuffed koala Wendell. <laughs> OK. Um, so my app, if you haven't seen it, let me run it for you real quick. Uh, simple tile slider puzzle game. Let me uh, play one for you here to show you that, yes, I can play. And what happens when this is the kind of thing where I got to record YouTube videos for people to learn how to play it, right? <laughs> Gotta get that 10 over there, the 11, boom, 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 boom. Oop. There we go. Done. <laughs> and you can see on my high scores page that is actually not my best time. Uh, Best time is 23 seconds, or three seconds for a three by three, 40 seconds for a five by five. I have played this a few thousand times. <laughs> I know the patterns. Um, so my scores don't ever compare yourself to those. Anyway, let's look at uh, what we got going on in the app. Now, really the best practice for doing this instrumentation is to create a distinct layer, like you would do a data access layer in a lot of apps. You wanna have a telemetry layer where the interface to that layer is about the, the events that are meaningful to your app in particular. Because when you look at uh, groups like Localytics and their SDK, they have like three or four functions on their particular object that you're instantiating. Um, and so, but you, wanna, you don't wanna have to think about those details elsewhere in your app. Or to give a solid example, when you complete a game, I have a lot of information that I want to collect, and I need to do some processing on that information, like bucketing ranges of numerical values, um, collecting some other bits and pieces that I want to know about, and I don't want to put that logic anywhere else in my app. Or when I resize the view and I'm trying to uh, collect some data on whether people are playing in landscape or portrait or whether they're playing with a split screen or not, then I, I do that when, whenever you resize the app. It just throws in a, uh, calls into one function in the telemetry layer that can then do all the logic for me. So this telemetry.js that I've created, um, here's localytics.js, by the way. It's uh, just their library, the small JavaScript file that um, I brought in. Um, I, don't, I, I got the code here, but I never really looked at it. I just know uh, how to use it. So I've just created a, uh, a simple namespace called telemetry in my app. It's a, it's a namespace with a bunch of static methods in it, so I don't need to instantiate a telemetry object. I just call telemetry dot whatever. Um, so if you look over here in default.js, for example, I have an initialization function. I have a visibility change event handler, so I can log telemetry when you're, you're switching away from the app or back to it. I have a resized handler, which, like I said, is logging uh, the size of uh, the views and so forth. So I have an app started event. So you see that my layer is expressing the events that are interesting to me, which Localytics, of course, knows nothing about. It just knows about events generally. So I'm making a layer that translates the events of interest into um, Localytics particular calls. So I have in this layer, like you can see, my current page, last navigation time, settings time, just some information that I want to track uh, while I'm going on. You know, I have like here an error whitelist because down here, if I scroll a little bit, I have an error handler here and I actually have a whitelist that I say if an exception occurs in localytics.js, which I have actually found happens, uh, that I ignore, I don't want to log that as an error in my app. I just wave that aside. And if I was using multiple uh, libraries that may surface exceptions like that that I'm ignoring, then I just want to automatically filter that out and never let it get to my back end. Um, but anyway, let me show you here the initialization function. You see I have here my three, uh, my developer key, my beta key, and my license key that I've created separately uh, on Localytics. Um, and I basically, whichever key I have using, I, I, I don't bother doing telemetry when I'm running in blend, uh, where, where I do my CSS styling. So I check design mode. If it's enabled, I'm in blend. Let's not actually do any telemetry. That wouldn't be very useful, even during development. 
Um, I also have, uh, so you can see here that I, that I create the localytic session uh, by just saying localytic session with the key, that's the initialization function. I open it, which then opens the channel to the back end, and after that, when I call things like um, telemetry upload or telemetry tag, or the session tag event, uh, it'll, it'll start logging stuff to the back end. I do want to point out this little piece of code I have here where I have an enabled flag and also an opted out flag. Telemetry could be interpreted as personal data. Um, and so you want to disclose that in your privacy statement. And in my, uh, in my app, you'll see if I go to the settings panel here and go to the privacy statement, I have an opt out button here. And if you opt that out, I basically turn the telemetry off. I think that's a good courtesy for your customers to, make, to let them know that this is what's going on and let them opt out of that, of course. Now, this isn't age sensitive, by the way. This, I've submitted this app to the store as an age three plus because it's not personally identifiable information. It has nothing to do with social networks. It has nothing to do with arbitrary sharing to social networks. And so it's okay for that age rating. You don't have to be a 12 plus or anything like that. Okay, so basically that's kind of my, my, my uh, entry gates, you might say, to my different layers. So let me go down now to um, a few of the interesting ones. See, a lot of these, like, apps started, I check, do I have a, a telemetry session? Am I enabled? If so, tag an event called app start with the property of whether or not I was restoring my state. So this is one thing where I want to know if you've started my app after it was suspended and then terminated and I'm restoring the state to that previous setting, I want to know how often that happens. That's interesting to me. So I log that property with this event. Same thing, spending, resuming. Um, like in resuming, I do an upload just to make sure. Uh, here's visibility change, pretty uninteresting, but app resized is an interesting one to see. Because here, I'm, I want to know what kind of device you're running on. And I can do that. I can look up the graphics display, I can get the width and height of the screen, I can get the orientation, and then I can also get the actual, um, the information about the view in itself. So I'm collecting all this information about orientation, about scale, about the orientation of the view if I'm in a portrait or landscape uh, layout. Uh, which changes because uh, just to show it, um, I can in fact go here and whoops, uh, make it smaller. And, and I've done the layout work to make a good portrait uh, experience on here. But I really want to know if people are using it this way, if I should do any kind of further investment um, or not. So I want to gather that information. And then once I have all of these properties put together, I can then tag an event called view resize with that data. Now notice here I have this little convert to range function which I wrote, very, very simple. I go back up here and show it to you. Um, basically just takes a value, whatever granularity you want. So if you give it a granularity of 25, it'll create strings like zero to 24, 25 to 49, 50 to 74, and so forth. So just a nice little helper function for the rest of my layer. But again, I have it in this layer so I don't need to pollute the rest of my app code with these kinds of considerations. Uh, similar thing when I go down to, let's see, so you see I got uh, new grid, restarted, page nav. These are just my events that I'm logging. Scores view changed, scores cleared, game started. Uh, and then here's, uh, so game started is where I log how long it's been since you last played a game. And you'll see that I should have, um, when we look at the data on localytics, you'll see that I should have an upper bound for this, which I currently don't. Um, and then here's the game completed. Um, uh, function that I have, and I'll show you where I call that over in my game.js file. All of this is essential to the uh, operation of the game. I stop the timer, I make a little animation on it, I reset some things, I get the information I need uh, to determine what kind of a metal you get and so forth. I animate some things, play the sound, fan, sound, fanfare sound, and then I collect enough information just to send to my layer, and you'll see telemetry.game completed, rows, columns, time, moves, metal. Um, is the kind of stuff I want to record with that. Uh, but that's, what's, what, that's what the app knows, is I've been playing the game, and then in that particular um, function itself, I'm going to do things like bucketing the times, and here you see, I, like I mentioned before, if my time is less than 45 seconds, I'm going to bucket it by uh, five, second in, uh, five second granularity. If it's above that, but less than two minutes, I want to do it against 20 seconds. If it's beyond uh, two minutes, I want to do 60 seconds. So that's what this very granularity line right here is accomplishing. So I convert that to range. I also am tallying uh, what kind of input you use to play the game. So I'll know if you actually did it through touch or did it through mouse or did it through keyboard. 
And this is interesting because it took me some time to implement a keyboard interface. And if nobody ever uses the keyboard to play a game like this, then maybe in future apps I don't need to bother. And I can just get away with doing mouse and touch. Um, I can say that with my uh, early releases that I've made inside Microsoft, most people are sitting there at their desktops with you know, laptops or desktop machines that don't have 24-inch you know, touch monitors, so I got a lot of mouse input. <laughs> uh, but that, you know, I, I expected that. You can see here where I, have, um, I, I check whether the internet's connected. I wasn't checking this null before, that's why I got that one crash I mentioned. Um, so I'll, I'll just get all that information together and then log a game completed event. So you can see that I have this layer, I'm putting my logic in there to convert information from my game engine and putting it into the telemetry data that I'm trying to collect. So let's now go to the Localytics website where I've uh, created my keys and downloaded the SDK and see what's coming out the other end. I will mention that most of these providers, um, by the way, have a free service tier, so until you get to a certain number of events being logged or a certain number of users, uh, it will be a free service. And so once you get successful, just like we have with Azure, once you get beyond a certain level of usage that means your app is being successful, then you'll have to uh, start paying for the service. But otherwise, most of them are free to, get, uh, to begin with. So you can see here that um, I, uh, this is a, the game started event, which comes up in uh, the analysis. Let me actually go back to um, uh, the analyze here, where we start. Up here I have the, the different keys, my beta dev and production. So uh, we can see here that I'm getting uh, some good hits on my, um, I got 76 game sessions and 23 users. So that's some of you uh, have clearly been playing this game. And I can see that spike because I, I did a little bit of marketing. Uh, to you, and you got engaged, and then I see the response of my marketing campaign coming out here. I can see a little earlier, if I, if I went back in time a little bit, I did a blog post on the Windows App Builders blog with the same session content called Instrumenting uh, Apps for Telemetry and Analytics, and I put a link to my game in there as a demo. <laughs> I can get some users that way. And, uh, and certainly, I saw a spike at that time. So you can track you know, what you're doing outside, um, outside of your app to, to drive users. And there's some key metrics in here. We don't have to go into all the details. Uh, this, is something you'll, this is where you're looking at your analytics on the back end. So now you can see where all those events that I was tagging, the, the names of the events that need to be human readable verbs uh, to be meaningful to you on the analytics back end. If you were just saying mouse click and, and you had a bunch of random data about what coordinates on the screen were clicked, that wouldn't be very actionable from here. But if I look at something like new grid chosen, this is where um, this gets logged when you're on this, uh, the main screen and you do a grid size and switch to three by three or five by five. I wanna know if people are discovering that and if they're using it. And I can see that um, I'm getting actually a, a number of occurrences for there. And then here's the attributes down below. I can see the size that people are choosing, whether it's a three by three, five by five, or four by four grid. And uh, I'm actually getting a pretty decent distribution here. What this tells me is that that grid, that grid choosing control down in the app bar is discoverable. If I only saw the default of four by four here, like 98% and occasionally one of the others, I would say, you know what, I think I have a discoverability problem. I need to surface that feature more prominently in my user experience. But the fact that I look at this, I can see, no, you know, that's reasonably discoverable. So one of the things I'd like to do with this game that my beta version has is I have it going up to eight by eight grids. And those are things that I might wanna monetize or do things like, if you share to Facebook about this game, I'll turn on the six by six grid. If you go do a ratings and review in the store, I will turn on the seven by seven grid, and if you pay me $1.49, I will turn on the eight by eight, <laughs> or something like that. Um, and I know now from this, I'm confident that people will discover those grid sizes and perhaps click on that menu option, and then that's a moment where I have the opportunity to uh, in, you know, engage more users or do a social sharing or monetize in some capacity. So you can see how I, you know, I, I wanted to answer that question, and now I'm getting the answers to that looking at the portal here. Um, similarly, let me find the uh, game completed. Actually, let me find view resize is interesting to look at. You can see that, uh, yeah, people are uh, changing the size, although this, this is logged when you first start the app, which is one thing I'd, I'd like to change a little. Well, this is really interesting. People play this in landscape. 
98% of my users are playing in landscape and not portrait. So if I do another game like this and I need to do a trade-off between implementing a certain feature and implementing portrait layout, which should I choose? Should I choose portrait layout? Eh, maybe not. Let's just let that be a, hang out there a little bit and not be that great uh, for my first release and then maybe I can come back uh, with, with my V1.1 and do that a little differently. Uh, similarly, uh, so what, what height are these playing at? This tells me a lot about the devices that are being run on. Uh, similarly, the width. Are people actually playing at small widths? Let's see here. Well, we got 62% between 1200 and 1399, which means they're playing at 1366, which is a lot of devices out there running that. My next best tier is 1800 to 90. Okay, this is an HD display on an Ultrabook like this one. Um, am I getting a lot of stuff down lower resolutions? Oh, actually not. You see, and if I click on this view, I can see some more detailed graphs here. So are people playing at a small size for occurrences? You know what, this is probably me playing with the app because I test those things with my production key. So you know what, I know that that's not a, 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 a typical occurrence uh, for people. Um, and anyway, you see a lot of, this is where you start analyzing and getting those answers to your questions. And just to finish up, uh, here's that game completed event. Actually, no, let me go to the uh, game, com well, game complete is interesting. I'll see how many people are winning what kind of medal. Oh, I actually got some gold medalists and some silvers, not too bad. Many of those are probably me, because <laughs> I do play with my production app. Um, and I can see how, you know, where people are playing in connectivity and so forth. But let me go back to that one example I had of some bad data that was showing up. So this is my game started event, and I have a time since last game um, uh, attribute that I log with this event. Now, what you see here is some pretty unactionable data. I have a bunch of occurrences with not any. Ugh. What did I do there? Well, that's when you're first playing the game and you don't have a previous game to count against. Why am I logging this? I should filter that out, right? I don't need to log this because it's polluting my data. Now, this data here, 10 to 19, and 4 to 4 is just a bucketing on a range of 1. Uh, that's just how my little bucketing function spit it out. And yeah, this stuff is useful here, but then I get up here and it's like, ooh, if you can see that, let me zoom in a little bit. If you see that 44,620 to 44,629, ooh, that's not very useful data. You know, I should look at this and say, I think after maybe 10 minutes, which is like 600, I should just cut it off and say greater than 10 minutes or something like that. So this is a really good example where I need to debug and change my instrumentation a little bit to make this analysis uh, more useful. Okay. Now uh, let me switch back to the slides here and wrap up so you guys can all get to the fun of the evening. So as we've been talking about in the session, telemetry and analytics, it's how you learn what customers are doing with your app in the wild. Without it, you are really flying blind. I, I was talking, the, my initial inspiration for doing this talk was talking with one of the testers in the mail app and he was saying, you know, if you're not, if you're not instrumenting for telemetry, and you get a crash, you have no idea what the user was doing up to that point. You'll know that the crash happened, which is one thing, but how did they get there? How can I repro it so we can actually drive more quality in the app? And that's why it's such an essential feature is because you only get so much from the store analytics and so much from the market-wide analytics, and to do anything greater, you really need to do it in your app itself. It does take conscious design to do this well. And it, like I say, it's an app feature that you want to iterate on and debug and improve and continue to work that until it's, you're getting the rich data that is of such value to you. Uh, don't just do it as a one-off or, or do it at the end of a project. Think of it like the rest of your design. It's the design that drives your answers to your business questions. And, and, and those questions help drive your business. So all of these things really relate to make a high quality app that users are going to love, that's going to get you featured, that's going to get more users and more uh, revenue for you ultimately. So with that, um, I, there are some related sessions here. Uh, if you want to take a picture, do it quick because I'm going to go to the, um, <laughs> I'm going to go to the eval slide next <laughs> before I ask questions. Um, but there's some on uh, 
the two first up here, there's driving and uh, maximizing revenue. That's Bernardo Zamora's session. I think it was uh, parallel to this, or maybe it has already happened. Driving user engagement is a fun talk that my uh, teammate Jim Cox and Ashwin Kamath are doing uh, tomorrow. Uh, so they, they're going into things like monetization strategies and making uh, in-app games and so forth. There's a couple sessions on Microsoft's application insights, and then some interesting ones on design that have a lot to do with user experience as well. Um, now, before I take questions, I'm going to do the standard plug for feedback. And why I want to be insistent about this, number one, is I've been part of the team that's been uh, helping pull together the Windows and Windows uh, Phone track for build. I've actually been doing it for the last couple of years. And last year, we had like five evals for each session. It's dreadful. Like, we had no idea what people wanted. Bad telemetry, right? <laughs> we really need to know when we put these sessions out there, what do people want to see? What are they engaged by? What, what rated the best? And when you get just a smattering of data, you, you don't really get good, uh, good telemetry or good analytics for that. So really help us out by driving the kinds of sessions that you want to see. And it's, uh, and it's not a plug for giving me good evals. I want to know for the whole conference, every session you go to, please fill out an evaluation. Uh, and even if you watch something online later on, because all this stuff goes on Channel 9, and hello to everyone watching on the internet for the next year and a half, um, you know, please see if you, you know, leave comments and leave feedback, leave ratings, because all of that drives our design for the next build uh, that, that will probably be coming up sooner than we think. <laughs> I don't know. I have no promises. So. <laughs> anyway, if you do have any questions, uh, please ask them now. We have... Uh, about five minutes until it's 6.30. I don't want to uh, hold anyone. Uh, please go to the microphones for the sake of the recording. And I will stay here after the session as long as, uh, as you need me to. So just a couple of questions first. Uh, yes. Very quick. Uh, is it possible to force telemetry to stay off of cellular data connections, force it only to Wi-Fi? Um, you, you should be able to detect what kind of connection you have and then make that decision. Because you can get that information from the Windows so Runtime API. up to you in your code, then? Yeah, it's up to you in your code, unless the provider does that automatically. Okay. And yeah. one other really quick one, what, the personally identifiable information, who's the policeman for whether that's contained in telemetry or not? So if, if you collect anything like that, you need to disclose it. That, right. and, so it's and up to so the app designer. It's up to the app designer, and the Windows Store cert team will look at Check. that and kind of, but, but generally, that's only like a username or you know, your contact list or something like that. But that has to be disclosed in your privacy statements. Yes, over here. Yeah, um, does the uh, uh, services you mentioned, do they work pretty much the same way if you're developing the game in um, Unity? Um, yeah, I don't know what Unity does um, in and of itself. They may be instrumented in some capacity or another. But uh, pretty much, if, if, if that kind of a framework doesn't have the instrumentation, then you would add it um, manually. Uh, through whichever, you know, however you can plug into that structure. But yeah, I don't know that for Unity offhand. Okay. Good question. Yes, over here. Uh, are you for forced by law to advise the user that you can connect data about usage data in the US? I don't believe you are because it's not personally identifiable okay. and it's not sharing to a social network. It's not being shared with a third party. So if you look at the Windows Store certification policy, it says, you know, the age rating is affected by personally identifiable and um, unrestricted access to a social network. Cool. So I don't think it's, my interpretation of that is that you don't, there's not a law that says that because just that you clicked here or you played this game with this time, that's not personally identifiable in any way. And, right. and so, yeah, I got this app through the store, no problem. So I, I, I think we're clear there. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, over here. And uh, which telemetry uh, technology is used in Microsoft Office, for example? Say that again, I didn't. Which uh, telemetry, I don't know, SDK or technology or implementation is used in Microsoft Office? What, which one are we using internally? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, a lot of them have been implemented manually um, over the years. Um, this is partly why the Application Insights guys have been kind of making one that we can all use. Uh, but I know that, you know, I, I think it all depends on the kind of apps people are building and, and what kind of SDK. I don't really have data on that. But I know, like, on the phone, Flurry is very, very popular. Yeah. But they all do pretty much the same stuff, so it's really go out to the portals and see what experience you like best for, um, you know, which one seems to be giving you the right kind of information that you want. Thank you. Yeah, uh, one more question, and then we can come up. Yeah. Uh, hey, uh, so sending the data back for the consumer world is, like, totally fine, but what is your guidance for the enterprise apps? Because, like, sending anything out of an enterprise, it's... Mm -hmm. 
raises red flags, PR disaster, legal? Yeah, so in that case, you're probably looking at doing a little more work on your own and basically using like logging APIs to uh, tag the events that you're saving locally and then being able to go to your own in-network server for that. Dave, do you have a question? Please um, go up to the mic. <laughs> uh, I was just going to say that some uh, vendors provide you with their server for a fee, of course. Mm. So you can run that server in your enterprise and the data will not be leaving your enterprise. I know uh, Reliable Analytics does it. The guys uh, um, that come with DocuSkater uh, does that for a lot of money, of course. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, uh, continuous, continuation of that. So anything that go over the pipe in clear text is a no-go in enterprise, right? So does mm -hmm. Microsoft provide an API or something like, or we have to use some so I, SSL channel? Yeah, I, I would check with the App Insights guys because they may be solving that problem for enterprise. Um, I haven't studied their particular solution yet, but they're trying to be very, uh, very broad and very applicable, I, and they may be including that. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, it's it's six thirty. So if you uh, want to claim any of these little prizes here, show me that you've uh, <laughs> you show me your uh, score stats page and whatnot. Otherwise, thank you very much and have a great rest of build. <laughs>